We'll go ahead and get started this morning. I don't know about you, but I like rain. And I like driving in rain, which I know seems a little weird, but I have a reason, okay? I like it when it rains just enough that the road gets a little wet, not too slick. And like if you drive through the city at night, all of the lights kind of reflect off of it. And it makes like this big, like almost like neon city. Everything's just illuminated so interestingly. Now, I don't really get to do that very often in Houston. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it doesn't rain because obviously it rains a lot here. Uh, what I have noticed is that in my time living here that, that people in Houston cannot drive in the rain. And so it ruins the experience for me when the person in front of me is doing donuts because they took a left turn too hard. And so what I have noticed though is that there are types of rain I don't like to drive in. And one of those in particular are torrential downpours. I like driving in the rain. I don't like driving when I can't see in front of me. And in 2020, I drove through the hardest rain I ever have in my entire life. When I was working at my last church in Georgia, I used to occasionally have to drive up to our main campus and help out with broadcasts during COVID. And so this was about a 45-minute drive from my campus to the other one, about 40 miles long. And usually there was nothing wrong with this. It was just a quick trip up the interstate. But I will never forget one time in particular, I was driving and about 10 minutes into the trip, I got hit with this wall of rain. And it, like, I've driven through hard rain before. Y'all, it's the hardest rain I've ever driven through in my life. You literally could not see further than five feet in front of my car. And so of course, I had a normal reaction, I panic right? Because I can't see. I don't know where I'm going. I have no idea what's going on. And so I'm freaking out until I realize that if I can just look like right ahead to the left, then I was driving in the right lane and I could actually see occasionally the little lane markers and they were just dashed lines. And so every once in a while, if I could just keep somewhat straight and stay in those lines, I was okay. Now in that moment, I would have loved to see exactly where I was going. I would like to know where I was going. I'd like to know when I was getting to my destination, but I couldn't see anything in front of me. I had no idea what the road ahead was. And so the only thing I could do in that moment was to look at the markers. So I had a choice, right? I could either pull over on the side of the road and go nowhere, or I could drive literally marker to marker to marker. And that is exactly what I did. For 30 miles, I drove only being able to see the occasional white line on the side of the road. And thankfully, it was a terrifying experience, but I made it there safely. Well, we're continuing in our sermon series, Lessons with Joseph. And what we've been doing is taking the past few weeks to walk through the life of Joseph. And he's got an incredibly interesting life. It's not always fantastic. There's a lot of low points that we've talked about, and we'll talk about some more today. But Joseph also has a lot of high points in his life. And what's really neat is that as you walk through his story, there are all sorts of lessons and truths that we can learn to apply to our lives. And so this morning, we're gonna look at the story of Joseph's rise from prison. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to the end of Genesis 39, and we're gonna start there, and then we're gonna make our way through chapters 40 and 41 as we go today as well. Now, if you've been keeping up with the story of Joseph up to this point, it's no shocker to you to say that Joseph has not exactly had an easy life. Quick little recap for you. Joseph's brothers hated him. They thought they were going to kill him, decided that was too much, still betrayed him, sold him into slavery. He goes to Potiphar's house, thinks everything's fine. And while he's there, his master's wife accuses him to try to sleep with him and he is falsely imprisoned. That's Joseph's life up to this point. And so if you're observing that, it's worth asking the question, given everything that happens to Joseph, where's God in this story? Right? Because if Joseph's story is supposed to be about this powerful rise from prison, that he rises to prominence in Egypt, and it's through Joseph that his family and his nation actually sustains and grows, why do we not see any of these big miraculous acts? Right? Because it's so often in the Old Testament that we're treated to grand displays of God's power. Right? God, with a loud, booming, thunderous voice or a flame from a burning bush, declares his plans and his commands for his people. Or we get to treat it to these grand moments of deliverance, like the splitting of the Red Sea in Egypt or the rising up of judges to, to slay armies in front of Israel. But Joseph's story is a little different. There's no booming voice. There's no burning bush. There's no pillar of fire or a split ocean. Joseph does not hear from God, and it's not obvious what God's doing in his life. But don't mistake what seems to be silence in the moment for God not being active in the story of Joseph. 
Look at what happens at the end of Genesis 39 and verses 20 through 23. It said, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who were held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So we left last week with Joseph being imprisoned, but we immediately pick up in our story this morning with this beautiful reminder that God is with Joseph. And God's been with Joseph the whole time, even through his being sold into slavery, because Joseph gets sold into slavery. And in that moment, he could have had a brutal life, but God leads him to be bought by Potiphar. And while he's under Potiphar's care, God blesses everything he does so that Joseph actually rises to a position of authority in Potiphar's house. And even now, as Joseph finds himself in prison, it says that God is still working. And that as Joseph finds himself in prison, God has now again put him in a position to do incredible things. But Joseph doesn't see any of that. What Joseph sees is prison. And so Joseph in this moment isn't quite sure how God's working in his life. He can't see what he's doing. But that doesn't mean that Joseph just sits back and does nothing that Joseph doesn't really know what God's plan for his life is. He doesn't really understand exactly how God's working in this moment, but Joseph also doesn't sit back and do nothing. Instead, it says that Joseph is actually still actively serving God, that he's growing in his relationship with God, and he's continuing to serve others as he walks out his time in prison. And so as we study Joseph's rise from prison, you're going to find that he not only serves God in every situation that comes his way, but you're also going to get to watch God work through all of Joseph's small acts of obedience that lead to his rise from prison, that God takes Joseph's actions of obedience and uses them to bless his life in incredible ways. Now, if we were honest with ourselves, many of us have found ourselves in the same position as Joseph is right here. And I'm not talking about prison, but if we were honest, we've had moments in our life where it feels like God's not working. And maybe there have even been moments in your life where you felt like God's just not there at all. And maybe that's not even something that you've walked through in the past. Maybe this is something that you're walking through right now. But whatever situation you're going through in this moment, I want you to know that God is with you. That even though you can't see him working in this moment, even though you don't know the plans that he has for your life, that doesn't mean that God is not doing things in your life. And so I want to encourage you as we get started this morning to not give up on God, even in the times of uncertainty. And so what I want to challenge you with is that even though you can't see the road ahead, don't pull over on the side of the road. I want to encourage you this morning instead to learn to live your life marker by marker, moment by moment, that even when we can't see what's going on in our lives, that we can learn to serve God and be obedient to him day by day, moment by moment, situation by situation. And like Joseph, if we can learn to do that, I believe that we'll watch God do amazing things in our lives. So this morning, we're gonna take a look at some practical truths from the story of Joseph about how we can do that. I wanna talk to you about ways that we can learn to be content in whatever situation we find ourselves in, but also how to be obedient and serve God no matter what situation we're in. So we're gonna start this morning with looking at chapter 40, verses one through seven. It says, sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. And after they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. And when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. And so he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Now, we're not exactly sure how long Joseph's been in prison at this point, but here's what we do know. He's been there for a while, and Joseph's pretty well aware at this point that this isn't like some temporary situation. This is home for Joseph at the moment. And what I love about Joseph is that he never complains. Like not once do we see him lamenting about a situation. He's not grabbing the guards and trying to be like, you don't get it. I don't deserve to be in here. Joseph just continues to be obedient to God in whatever situation he's in. And he did the same thing in Potiphar's house and he's doing the same thing here. And so Joseph, he takes the position that he's in 
seriously. It's not glamorous, and he has no idea if he'll ever make it out of prison, right? He has no idea what God's doing in this moment, but it doesn't change the way he lives. That he still has an active, growing relationship with God, and he serves God throughout all of it. And so it's interesting, even as we start our story this morning, that Joseph sets this incredible example for us, right? Because here's Joseph, this innocent man who's done nothing wrong in this moment, and he finds himself in prison for something he didn't do because of a woman who did do what he is blamed for. But he doesn't focus on his own needs. He doesn't even share his own story with people. Right, because if anybody had the, the opportunity and the right to share their story or, or beg for people to tend to them, it's Joseph at this point, because dude's had a hard life. But instead of focusing on his own needs, Joseph instead serves other people. And specifically in our story this morning, he serves this cupbearer and the baker. And so Joseph's response to circumstances, it's a great lesson for us to observe, and it's gonna lead us to our first truth in how we live marker to marker is that we have to embrace the uncertainty. If we were honest with ourselves, we would love it if we knew every bit of God's plan for our life, right? If we had it our way, if we could pick, we would see every mistake we would make, we would see every victory we would have, we would see every twist and every turn and change of the plot, and we'd see exactly where we end up in life. But the reality is, we rarely get to see any of that. Very rarely do we ever actually get to know God's plan for our life. But just because we don't know God's plan for our life doesn't mean he's not working. The scripture says that God is working constantly in everything, that every situation we go through, every moment we walk through, that God is still with us and moving in that moment. And so what that means is that even in the hard situations, these moments of incredible pain and uncertainty and doubt, these are the same moments that God will use for his glory and for our good. Paul talks about it this way in Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this verse, it's not a promise that life's always gonna be easy. And it's definitely not a promise that God's gonna take every situation in your life that's bad and end it with some kind of fairy tale ending. But here's what it is a promise, is that God is working every situation in your life for good. That even when it doesn't feel like it, even the bad moments we walk through, God will use. And I love that Paul uses a word for good here. The way it's translated in the Greek, it lends to this idea that something is good even when we don't realize it. Regardless of whether it looks good or not, it is good. And this word good here also has a very broad range of meanings. And the reason for that is, is that in this context, when you're talking about different situations in life, what good comes out of that can look very different depending on the situation, right? Because some situations might lead you to grow in your relationship with God, that you actually grow, grow, grow closer to him as you're walking out this, this reliance on him for source of strength and peace in the moments of pain and chaos, right? Think about David in Psalm 23. He says, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that you're with me, your rod and your staff comfort me that we grow close to God in moments of pain. But some situations may also lead you to a different maturity and new perspective on life, something that gives you wisdom to walk through things in ways you didn't know before. Or maybe walking through a specific situation gives you experience and wisdom that you're now able to help someone else walk through something very similar to what you've gone through. Sometimes it means all of the above. Whatever we're walking through, God will use for his good. And so we don't have to know exactly how God is working in our life to know that he's working. That embracing the uncertainty means that we can trust that if we believe in God, that he is in control in all situations. And so what that means for us is that if we believe in the God we say we believe in, if we follow the creator of the universe who breathed the very galaxies into existence, who formed mankind by his hands, then we can trust that he's in control. We can trust that no matter what we walk through, God can use that situation. And so it means that embracing the uncertainty means recognizing that God will use every situation we walk through to sustain us, to grow us, and to fulfill the purpose that he's called us to. So how can we grow in embracing the, embracing the uncertainty? First, I would encourage you to find ways to remember the truth of God. That in the moments of silence where we feel like we can't hear God or don't know where he is, that we've been given the word of God in scripture. 
And so in those moments where we can't hear God, I would encourage you to read God's word and to remember that truth. Jesus gave a great example of this in Matthew 4, 2 through 4. It said, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry that the tempter came to him and said, if you were the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when Satan is trying to tempt Jesus when he's fasting, Jesus pulls a fast one on him and, and he uses scripture that he's memorized in response to this to help him get through this situation. And the specific scripture that Jesus uses actually highlights the importance of this, that scripture says we don't live by bread alone, but by the word of God. And what this means is that in these moments, these difficult situations where God's not speaking to us in that moment, we still have God's words to help speak into our life, to speak truth in there. And so if we have God's word, we can learn to use it in our daily life. And there's tons of ways that I would encourage you to do this. And there's some really easy things you can do. One of them in particular is simple memorization. I have friends that they want to memorize scripture. And so what they do is they literally will write it on flashcards and run through it over and over again. Like it's like multiplication tables or something. But if memorization is not your thing, if you're like, I just, I'm, I'm, there's no way, I can't even remember the pin code to my card, then I would encourage you to do things like download the Bible app. The Bible app, if you'll open it every single day, will give you a different verse for the day, and you can look at that and focus on it and use it to remind you of truth of God's word. But one of the coolest things that I've seen lately actually came from one of our church members a few weeks ago. Uh, she has this booklet that she's made and she opens it up and she handwrites Bible verses and then she puts them on little cards and she sticks them in this booklet. And so anytime she's walking through, you know, situations of pain or uncertainty and doubt and all these difficult things that she walks through, she takes this book and she opens it up and she just flips through it over and over again and reads God's word over and over and over and over to a reminder of God's truth. So whatever it looks like for you, I would encourage you find ways to remember God's word because in the moments where you can't hear his word, you can still read his word. Now embracing the uncertainty also means that we have to learn to be obedient even when we don't feel like it. That living in obedience to God, if we're honest with ourselves, is hard in and of itself. And so when we put ourselves in situations where we're dealing with difficulty or uncertainty or, or heartbreak or sorrow or any of these things, right, you're basically taking what's already a difficult task and you're making it even harder. And sometimes it even feels impossible in the moment. And so here's what we have to do is that in these moments where we don't feel like being obedient to God, we have to make the choice to be obedient to God regardless. And so I wanna encourage you that as you walk through difficult things in life to not just give up on your relationship with God because it doesn't feel right in the moment. And Joseph's a great example of this, right? I mean, think about everything he's gone through up to this point. His story, and it is an unwavering example of the faithfulness that we can have regardless of the situations we walk through. And so I wanna encourage you this morning that even in the moments that it feels hard and difficult or maybe even impossible to follow God, I would encourage you to try to push through that and to be obedient regardless of it. Because it's not always gonna be easy and we're not always gonna feel like doing it. But a relationship with God isn't about feeling like doing it, it's about living in obedience because of what he's done for us. Now, here's what I think is really cool about a relationship with God, is that if we can do that, if we can learn to be obedient even in the difficult situations, that that actually helps us to grow in our faith. Look at what Paul says about this in Romans 5, three through five. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, when we make the choice to be obedient to God, even in the uncertainty, there's growth that comes out of that. And that growth, Scripture says, it leads us to a hope. And it's this hope that there's something more to life, that there's something we know that's bigger than what we're walking through in the moment, that we get to have faith and confidence in who Jesus is and what he's done and what that means for us in eternity. And so if we can learn to, to withstand the suffering, to be obedient even in the moments of difficulty, that it actually helps us to have a confidence in who we are and who we follow. So embracing the uncertainty, it's about learning to be content, learning to trust that God can get us through whatever situation we're in, and it's about learning to be obedient regardless of the situation we find ourselves in. And when we can do that, we watch God work in some really cool ways. All right, look with me at our next verses. This is verses six through 19. 
It says, so when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. And so he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in the master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. And so it says, this is what it means, Joseph said to him. Their three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in your hand, just as you used to do when you were cupbearers. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention to me Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread, and in the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the baskets on my head. And this is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. So we get two different dreams. The first dream is that the Pharaoh, or the the cupbearer, his dream ends up with good interpretation. It's like, hey, everything's all right. You're going to live. And then the the baker's like, oh, he got a good one. What's mine mean? He's like, hmm. Nothing good. You're going to die. It's like you're going to be beheaded. Your body's going to be put on a stick. Not going to end well for you. But what starts as a simple act of service here is actually going to lead to Joseph getting an interesting opportunity while he's in prison. Right? Because Joseph's not, he hasn't really been looking for ways out of prison up to this point. But what starts as going, hey, are you okay, leads to him giving this cupbearer a good interpretation of his dream. And so he says, look, when you get to Pharaoh, you tell him who I am, that I'm an innocent man who does not deserve to be in prison. And, and I trust that this dream's going to work out and you'll get that opportunity. And so that's what happens. The dream actually goes well and he gets the chance to hopefully have his case pleaded to Pharaoh. Now, for the sake of time, I'm about to condense 50 verses for you into about four sentences. So what's going to happen is these dreams are going to come true. That the cupbearer and the baker are going to find themselves before uh, the Pharaoh and the cupbearer gets to live. The baker does not. But After the cupbearer lives, he gets so excited in the moment, he completely forgets about Joseph. And he's going to forget about Joseph for two years. Until Pharaoh ends up having a dream that he needs interpreted, and he brings in all of his people, all of his wise mages and and the magi and all these people. None of them can figure out the dream. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers, he's like, oh, I left that dude in prison. But he he can interpret the dream. So he gets Joseph out of prison. He brings him to Pharaoh. He gets the opportunity to interpret the dream. He does. And he tells Pharaoh, hey, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a famine. You need to prepare for it. And so because of the interpretation that Joseph has for Pharaoh, he's actually going to help Pharaoh prepare for the coming famine. And what's going to be interesting is what's going to happen in the following verses is that as a result of Joseph's wisdom in helping the Pharaoh deal with this, something really cool is going to happen. Look what happens. We're going to skip to to chapter 41, looking at verses 39 through 45. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as a second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. And so Pharaoh gave Joseph the name zaphnath paneah and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout all the land of Egypt. So what starts is this small act of obedience, right? Remember, he's just serving people in the beginning, led Joseph to being placed in charge over all of Egypt directly under Pharaoh. And it's through this position in particular that God's going to actually not only bless Joseph in this moment, but he's going to sustain Joseph's family, which will lead to sustaining the nation of Israel, and it's going to lead to the growth of the nation of Israel. But what's so amazing to me about this story is not Joseph's rise from prison, I think that's a really cool result of his obedience, and it's great to see that God is blessing him as a result of that. But what's interesting about Joseph's story is that God uses his small acts of obedience to leave a lasting generational impact on the family of Joseph. That because of what Joseph does, his family will not only survive, but the nation of Israel will thrive. And so God uses Joseph's simple obedience to make an incredible impact in his life and the people around him. 
And here's what I want you to know. The same is true for you. Now, I'm not going to sit here and promise you that if you're obedient to God, he's going to put you in high positions in your job. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that God's going to give you your wildest dreams if you're obedient to him. But what I will promise you is that if you're obedient to God, that he will give you a purpose in your life greater than anything this world has to offer. And that your simple acts of obedience can lead to a generational impact in your family and the people around you. And this is going to lead us to our second truth this morning, is that we need to look for the small moments, not the big miracles. So you don't have to have grand moments of obedience for God to do big things in your life. And so if you'll be faithful to live out the calling he's placed in your life in the small moments, these simple everyday choices we make, that God will actually use that to make a huge impact in your life and in the people around you. And one way this is incredibly important is in your everyday faith. I mean, you guys, I don't think you realize how powerful it is for your family and your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors to see what it looks like for you to make an everyday choice to follow Jesus. That when we make things a priority, like reading our, reading our Bibles and praying and going to church and serving and doing all these things, man, you're setting an incredible example for the people around you to follow. And that stuff matters. And parents, this is incredibly important for y'all, that if you wanna leave a lasting spiritual impact on your family, it's as simple as making an everyday choice to make Jesus the priority. That it's those simple acts that can lead to your children having an active, growing relationship with Jesus. It's not big things. It's the everyday choices that we make. And there are other ways you can do this. One of the ways that I would encourage you to do this is to seek out small moments to show grace to others. You know, this is why we talk about intentional grace so much here at Care City. It's why we believe it's not only important, but it's our literal mission statement as a church to show intentional grace. Because we believe that if we can make the small everyday choices to show the grace of Jesus to people, that we get the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with them. And so we talked about intentional grace a couple of times in the past few weeks. And so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about what that looks like, but here's what I wanna challenge you specifically with this week. I want you to find one way to show intentional grace to a neighbor or a coworker. And so what I want you to do is to think through a way that you can show them kindness, you can serve them and make the choice to act on it. And again, these don't have to be big, grand things, right? We're talking small, simple acts of showing grace. Something as simple as praying for someone and sending them a text or taking someone to lunch and just hearing a little bit of their story. And those are the kind of things that can have an impact on people and actually lead to conversations about Jesus. And when we do that, man, lives and eternities are changed. Now, I would also encourage you that if you want to live in the small moments, you gotta be involved in people's lives, right? And so it's really hard to make an impact in the lives of people around you if you're not involved in the lives of people around you. And so we have to make a choice to be involved in the lives of people. One way that we do that here at Kara City is with community groups. And so I wanna challenge you guys, if you're not a part of one, in two weeks, we're actually launching our groups for the fall. And so we'll have signups in just a couple of weeks. And groups are an incredible opportunity to simply get involved in people's lives. They're not anything crazy or complicated, but it gives us opportunities to walk through life and faith together in community. So if you're not a part of one, I would encourage you to do that. And if you have any questions about it or wanna know about it, come talk to me, come stop by our Connect booth. We would love to answer any questions you have about it. But in all these different things, and there's many more examples we could give, the goal here, remember, is the small things, right? It doesn't take big miraculous acts of obedience to have an impact on the people around you. Sometimes it's as simple as the small choices we make every day. And so I wanna encourage you to look for the small moments of obedience, not the big acts of miracles. And if you can learn to do that, it'll make an impact on the people around you. All right, look with me at our last verses. These are verses 50 through 52. It says, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it's because God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it's because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So names are incredibly important in the Old Testament. If you didn't know this, your name in the Old Testament literally defined your life. And so as Joseph reflects on all that God's done and he gets an opportunity to name his sons, he picks two names in particular that have to do directly with what God's done in his life. And what I love about this is that Joseph's family, because of the way he names them in and of themselves, become this constant reminder of how God has brought him out of his life of suffering. And so when, we, when he named his sons, he did it to mark what God did in his life because he doesn't want to forget it, right? 
And, and so this is an incredibly important lesson for us to learn that if we will remember the things that God's done in our life, it's beneficial to us. And here's why. Because as we live life marker to marker, moment by moment, here's the thing. Sometimes there are moments of uncertainty, moments of doubt, moments of pain and sorrow. But there's also these moments where we get to watch God move in incredible ways. And if we make the choice to remember the ways that God moves in our life in these moments, when we go through these hard moments where we feel like God's not there, we feel like God's not working, we can look back at all that God has done for us and all the ways he's been faithful for us. And that helps sustain us through these hard moments. And so our last truth this morning is that if you want to learn to live marker by marker, you have to learn to mark your moments. And so Joseph made sure that he would never forget what God did for him. And the same thing has to be true for us, that we need to constantly remind ourselves of the ways that God has been helpful for us, the ways that he's blessed us in our lives. Because again, if we can remember what he's done for us when the hard times come, we can still remember the ways he's faithful and the ways he'll get us through that. And so marking the moments is an incredibly important thing for us to do. But it's more specific than just like thinking through the blessings in your life. Marking your moment means that you look for specific ways to remember the big moments where God drastically changes your life. One of the big ways that we mark moments in church today is baptism. Baptism is this moment where we're saved, right, by grace through faith, that as we repent of our sins and move towards obedience and we put our faith in Jesus as Lord, right, that's the moment of salvation. It's grace through faith. But we mark this moment of salvation, this incredible life change, with, with baptism. It's this beautiful act of obedience that lets people know that we've been changed by God. And so as we go under the water, we're dying with Christ. And as we raise out of the water, we have new life just as Jesus rose from the dead. And so it's a beautiful expression of what we've done. And it's an opportunity for us to remember what God has done in our life. So if you've never been baptized, it's, an, it's a beautiful way to mark your moment of salvation. And it's a step of obedience that we take as followers of Christ. So if you've never done that and you want to, look, I'll be in the back of the room in a minute. Please come talk to me. I'd love to help you with that. But marking your moments is not just about baptism. Again, it's about finding ways to remember specifically what God's done in our life. I have friends that have done something as simple as keep a journal, and they'll just write down every single day what God's done in their life, whether it's big or small, right? Sometimes it's these incredible things. Sometimes it's the little things. And then what they can do is when they're going through hard moments, they get to go back and look at all the things that God has done. And so when they're going through a hard moment, they can just flip through and see all the ways that God has blessed them. Sometimes marking moments can be something as simple as keeping a small item as a reminder of it that you see every day. Uh, One that I have in particular is I keep this small little Chick-fil-A cow. Uh, And and I've had it for five years. And I'll be honest with you, it's kind of like a silly little thing, especially if you know me and know that I don't really care for Chick-fil-A all that much, which I feel like is sacrilegious as a pastor. And so I'm repenting of that before you, but it's not my favorite. But I keep that cow not because I love Chick-fil-A, but because one of my good friends at my last church in Georgia gave that cow to me. And I keep it because it's a reminder to me of the incredible friendships that I had when I was in Georgia. And and these were the same friendships that got me through some ridiculously hard times in ministry. And I never want to forget that. And so every time I see that cow, I think about my friends. But whatever it looks like for you, I want to encourage you to find specific ways to mark your moments. Remember all the ways that God has worked in your life. And if you can do that when the hard times come and when we're faced with moments of uncertainty, even something as simple as remembering how God is faithful will carry us through. You know, something really cool I get to mark a moment with here in just a month. Uh, In September, my wife and I will have been at Care City for three years, which is really cool. And we love being, yeah, we love it. Um, I love going back and thinking about the first time I stepped into like the little four month old church plant in the little white chapel. And, you know, it's crazy. Like it really is to think back doing that in the summer of 2021 and to to look at we're in the summer of 2024. And I just think about all the ways that God has immensely blessed this church and all the things that he's done in that. And I've loved being a part of it for every second. And what I love in particular about thinking back on my time of coming to Karis City is, man, right before we got here, it was a huge moment of uncertainty for my wife and I. 
we made the decision to leave our church in Georgia. And when we did that, we had no idea what was going to happen. I, I had no idea what God's plan was beyond that. I, we had no plans for where we were going. You know, at that point, I was coming out of student ministry and was like, am I going to be a student pastor? What am I going to do now? We were looking at where we were going to live. We were talking about going to Mississippi, where my family was, or staying in Georgia, where her family was, or going to Alabama, which was like a good midpoint. Like, in no way was Texas even remotely on our radar. In fact, specifically, I told her, I will not take you as far as Texas. That was until I was online one day and I saw this job listing for this little church plant in Katy, Texas. And, you know, I, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but after looking at it, I was like, I don't know, something about this just feels like I need to at least consider applying for it. And so I remember calling Hannah and I said, hey, uh, I have this thing I want you to think about. There's this church in Texas we talked about not going that far and I, and I wanna honor that. I was like, so I'm just asking you, I'm not even saying we have to apply, just pray about it and let me know what you feel and, and what you decide. So Hannah spent some time in prayer and consideration. She comes back to me and she goes, all right, let's do it, let's apply. And we did and, you know, and now we're here and been here for three years. And what I love about thinking about that, man, is moving here was a huge leap of faith. At that point, I mean, I, I used to laugh because Nathan used to be like, I don't even know what will happen in a year with the church. And not only would I know what would happen with, with the church plant, and we didn't know what moving to Texas was going to be like, we had no idea what our life would look like. Completely uncertain of what God's plan was for this. And so the only choice we could make in that moment was to live marker by marker, moment by moment. We were going to say yes that day, and we were going to say yes the next day, and keep going every step of the way. And God has blessed that immeasurably living moment to moment in your life. It's not easy, I'm not gonna lie to you, but it's worth it. And so we don't have to see the whole road ahead to know that God's working. But if we can learn to live marker by marker, moment by moment, step by step, and we will watch God use that and use our obedience in beautiful ways to work in our life. So I wanna challenge you Embrace the uncertainty, look for the small moments of obedience, and mark the moments where God has blessed you in your life. If you can do that, and he will walk you through every situation you go through, and he'll do some incredible things in your life. Let's pray.